is that we are too close to the ship, but that's uh, couldn't be further from the truth. You can see hundred, a couple hundred yards away from the ship. So this was my first experience surfing at the age of 10. This is my mom's car with the, with the 10, 10 foot log strapped to the top. And that's the first day that I was introduced to surfing and thought there was waves in the bay. So I thought I'd mention that. This is uh, my first business in Galveston. I've owned a surf shop there for 35 years. So this was when I first opened in 1986. I put it into the proper perspective because it, it takes a lot of commitment and a lot of time to figure stuff like this out. You know, it took me years and years to perfect what we, what we do today. And this was my first uh, surfboard shake. Uh, in 1988, so I am a surf shop owner, surfboard maker, and now a, a boat captain, all in the surfing industry. And it, it takes that kind of commitment to find something like this and perfect it. This is uh, our first, one of our first missions out surfing the Tanker Waves. Our friends here, that's John Benson over there. He and I have been going out together for I don't know, 25 years now. This is the very first picture we took of the tanker waves. And it was like a Loch Ness monster site. <laughs> <laughs> That's really, really what it was. It comes out of deep water and it just comes up out of nowhere and we're like, there it is! So that was our first photo of the tanker wave. And here is a good example of what what they did back in the 60s, late 60s. Um, the, the two islands that I was showing you here, is, this is Atkinson Island here. Uh, it's changed quite a bit. They've rebuilt it and they've been using it as a dredge, uh, dumping dredge material there. All the spoil material has been taken there strategically. And this, uh, if you look on this chart, it's really hard to see, but Redfish Island, is the other spot that all the surfers would uh, would motor out to, and that's right here. The, this chart says Redfish Shoal because over the years the tanker waves destroyed the original Redfish Island. So that's really what happened was people were surfing back in the 70s, 60s, and then Redfish Island just completely was eroded away by increased <coughs> tanker traffic and all the ship waves that came through. So as you see right there, it's not even an island, and that was in the mid to late 90s. Uh, since then, they've rebuilt Redfish Island. It's not exactly, it's not a spot that we surf because the way they built it, it's had surrounded by deep water. So it doesn't, it doesn't break like it, uh, like it used to. But this is an example of surfing ship waves near uh, land. This is the only known picture left of a place that we learned a lot of our information. It was called The Point. It was a bar in La Fort. I don't know if anybody has ever been to, been to yeah, it was a bar at Oregon. It's called Point. The Goat Ranch. Was it? The Goat Ranch. The Goat Ranch. Dollar Shiner Long Ranch. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we started researching all this, and what I wanted to do was gather some information from the ship pilots or the shrimp boat guys, the, you know, some of the tugboat captains. So I started asking everybody, what bar do these guys go to so I can go and <laughs> gather information? So this was the end of the road here. This is the ship channel. This is the north end of Atkinson Island here. And if you turn left on the street, this is the only picture left on the internet. Uh, the bar set right there. So. When I started tanker surfing, I never owned a boat, never ridden a boat, and didn't know anything about the bay at all. So I wanted to go and try to find some of these pilots that would tell me uh, what the ship waves were. But at the same time, this place was pretty rough. And we were like, we both looked like John Dixon with long blonde hair surfer guy type. And these guys were pretty salty guys. So we went to this place and met a shrimp boat pilot by the name of Shrimper Dove. I don't know if anybody knew Shrimper Dove. He'd leave his shrimp boat behind the, the point bar. And so we finally got the nerve up to ask him about 
where not to go as a boat op, as a new boat operator that didn't know what he was doing. I used reverse psychology on him, so he could spill beans on the most dangerous areas where the waves broke. And so he didn't answer for about 15 minutes, but he finally said two numbers. That's all he said. He just mumbled two numbers, and those were obviously channel marker numbers. I didn't know that at the time, but he he mumbled two numbers, and sure enough, those places. We still serve those places today. I'm not going to share those particular numbers. <laughs> this is a good example of the, another example of the ship waves breaking along the land masses. This is the uh, this is the very far south end of the new Atkinson Island. As you notice, it's been shored up. They they've been spending years trying to shore this place up so the erosion doesn't cause it to disappear like the original redfish island did. So we, we surf these waves um, on certain very, very large vessels. This is a really, really good picture of the playing field. This was taken from one of the ship pilots. Uh, we know a lot of the ship pilots. We don't converse with them, obviously. But uh, this is just a good example of what it all, what everything looks like. It's, uh, it's a really interesting set of waves that you see is big horseshoe wave. Um, so this is a really good uh, bird's eye view of, of what, what, you know, what we're riding. Is this the Texas City Tide in the background? Yes, sir. Okay. This was my first boat and one of our first trips out there. This was um, the Texas City Dyke uh, launch. And that's John. Just wanted to show you that uh, our first boat was just a little, you need a really, really sh shallow draft vessel, obviously. Anchor surfing occurs because we have a 30 mile long shipping channel, this 50 foot deep uh, on average, and we have a relatively shallow bay. So, the difference between our setup here in Houston uh, port and any other port is the fact that these ships have to traverse in a straight line <coughs> without slowing down. They don't need tug assistance. They're not having to meander like any other, almost all other ports are really close to, uh, to sea. So they don't really need to travel that far. In this case, we launch way, you know, way here we travel 20 to 25 miles north and follow these ships and they're going in a straight line, right? And there's sh very shallow shoals on both sides of the channel, which is why this place is so unique, the most unique shipping channel that I've ever come across for, for tanker, <coughs> tanker waves. There are other tanker waves, by the way. We have tanker waves in Corpus, uh, Port Arthur, um, Calcasieu, Sal Padre, and anywhere else that you may know that you're not sharing the <laughs> <laughs> This is our first exposure. Uh, this is an interesting story. We kept this uh, very secretive for obvious reasons. We spent three or four years not telling a soul what we were doing. We were just allegedly really terrible fishermen. <laughs> going out there almost every day, allegedly fishing, and never coming home with fish. So we were about three or three and a half years in uh, without telling anyone except one friend. And that one friend got drunk on a plane and was sitting next to a filmmaker he didn't know at the time and started bragging about what we were doing to him. And he was a very famous filmmaker from California. And then the word got out really quickly. So the first filmmaker that contacted us, we refused. Uh, we didn't want to give, give away the farm, so to speak. And then I got a mysterious fax from someone that said Top Secret Productions on the top of the page. And, and it just asked me, are you the guy who rides large waves? And I was so mad that he thought we were riding large waves. I wrote this long time but I said, no, we don't ride large waves, we ride ship waves. And that ended up going online right away. <laughs> I posted it on surfline.com right away, and then we, the phone started ringing, and the next thing you know, the Browns of the Endless Summer reached out to us, 
And we made a decision at that point, we're gonna have to eventually let the cat out of the bag. And so we did it with Brown. And so the, it was in the summer three, and then they changed it at the last minute to step into liquid. So that's uh, uh, some footage of John and Peter and I uh, surfing at, in the film Step into Liquid, and that's what introduced Tanker Surfing to the world. So I don't know if any of you have seen that film, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's on HBO and Netflix. This is uh, the first uh, Google Earth image that we captured of Tanker Surfing <laughs> uh, on, a really, on a really brown day. Mid 2000s, and it shows you another example of how far away the energy is from the ship channel um, and the ship. I, I want you to realize that every one of those waves are are rival, if you look, but they're really tight and packed together. It's, it's there are dangers associated with tanker surfing, but they're mostly related to the boat operator, not necessarily the surfers. So you have to go through the, all those steps of waves to go back and pick people up. And it, it's a really dangerous area for the boat operators. It's not that dangerous, it's not really more dangerous than surfing on the beach for surfers, but it is dangerous for boat operators. So the first thing I want to highly recommend is if you go out there looking around and you get a registered boat captain, I can't, even if it's not me, it's gotta be somebody who knows these waters. There are ocean reefs, really shallow areas that you, you, gotta, you have to know about. Um, and you gotta follow the rules of the road, obviously. The ship pilots know what we're doing, but as long as you don't, you don't go in front of the ships and you follow the rules of the road, you're, it's relatively safe and legal. People ask if it's illegal, and no, it's not illegal, but it's illegal to do things you're not supposed to do as a, as a boat captain. So you just gotta be very, very careful about, about operating the boat more so than surfing. Uh, let me just see here. Um, let me show you the dynamics that I was telling you about on this chart here. This is uh, the entire bay complex, and this is the channel, if you can see all that. People always ask, where do you go? So I just say, we go here. <laughs> <laughs> so this is where we go. And if you notice, all we had back in the day, we didn't have GPS, I didn't have a fish finder. Um, so you have to use the uh, channel marker numbers to figure out where you are. But what makes us so unique is what I was telling you about, is a relatively straight line. And if you look at all this blue, all this blue are shoals. Now some of these shoals were made on uh, dredging projects that they weren't real strategic about where they put the material. Uh, others um, were just natural shallow areas of the bay. So um, this is the whole, this is the whole area that we serve. Uh, it's about 20 to, I don't know, 20 to 25 miles. So if you're gonna go out there, I recommend that you get some of these charts and study uh, a lot of these areas. There are uh, sunken ships out there. There are oyster reefs only a foot or two deep. So you really, really have to know where you're going out there. You can't just get in a boat and start running around out there. You are gonna run around and possibly flip your boat. Um, so let me keep going on the slide show here. I got the old side track. This is another uh, aerial view from the pl uh, from a plane uh, that shows the ship channel. Um, that's pretty old photo. That's the old uh, dike, um, and you see the tanker waves off to the off, off to the uh, north there. Um, so this area here is on the uh, east side of the channel, and it is the uh, closest you're going to get to the ships. We are very relatively close to the ships on this side. We didn't surf that area for about four years because we were, we were kind of testing the waters and didn't want to upset the pilots and it's really, really close to the ships. So we opted out uh, for a good three or four years um, on surfing on this side because as you see, we're close enough to maybe make them a little nervous. About how close, how close are you here? Um, 
I'm going to say that's about 150 yards, maybe, or maybe less. So that, that's, just, that's the closest you're going to get other than near the island. Um, this is another photo that one of the ship pilots took of us. Um, and it just shows you um, the, all the wave dynamic. This is the channel, obviously, right here. So it's a good view because it's one of the, it's one of the captains that, that took it. Here's one of the dangers that, uh, that, I, that we've seen out there many, many times. Um, a lot of folks will be out there fishing. Uh, they don't know the tanker waves are coming. They don't know anything about it, and they're anchored up. And this guy um, almost lost his boat, and we tried to yell at him many, many times, but there are a lot of salty guys out there, and they think they, they, think they know what, what they're doing. But uh, that's a good example of some of the dangers, and it's mostly, like I said, um, with the boat operators more than the surfers. This is another uh, danger, probably the most dangerous scenario. This is when two large ships meet. Um, and when that happens, if you're a boat operator, uh, you need to get out of there like really pronto. You see, the, you see how dangerous that is. Uh, so a lot of people don't realize that. It's, the ship coming very narrow. These guys are meeting. They're basically playing chicken. And uh, whenever they're away from the chicken, you know, me, it, this is what it's going to look like. If you all, also, you want to see this. This is all what would be normally two or three foot deep. Um, the, day, the other dangers are all the water that these ships displace. They're making a giant hole in the water, basically. And all that water is getting sucked off the shoal where your boat is or where you're surfing. So the way the water can go from three feet to bone dry. This is a, just a really good example. This was all water levels up here. And as it's, that's how much water can get moved and displaced uh, with all these ships. So that's a really good example of uh, one of the most dangerous scenarios. Um, this is a really good shot from again from one of my ship pilot buddies. Uh, this is the uh, far north end of Atkinson Island. Um, you see it's like a perfect point break. Um, one of the best waves in the bay. Can't tell you where that was. This is another uh, hour to get. This, this is a, a, a good picture except the fact that the water is only about a foot and a half deep there. So um, she didn't realize that. <laughs> um, so you, you have to be super careful. These, these areas that we serve are less than two foot deep a lot of times, and, and oyster reefs as well. That's uh, another one of the hazards. Uh, and while I'm talking about that, the, um, uh, a big danger is the bacteria. And it, it's not just in Galveston Bay, it's, it's in a, a lot, most bodies of water. But where we go, way up north, it's really bad because that water is still stagnant, doesn't move much. Uh, so if you get cut out there, you need to carry a big old jug and hip cleanse, if you know what that is, uh, because that water bacteria is extremely hazardous. So be really, really careful if you go out there and uh, cut yourself, jumping off a boat onto an oyster reef like that. This is a good example of uh, ship waves from the, from the pilot again. And it shows you how many waves these ships uh, make, sometimes seven waves. Uh, the lean wave obviously is what we're, what we're looking for. Um, so people also ask, where's that wave coming from? Is that the bow wave? Is that the stern wave? So this is the, all the stern energy. These larger ships can make a bow wave as well. And that's very, very hazardous because bow wave comes in at a 45 degree angle in front of these ship all these waves. And if if you are in that area, it's gonna push you into the shallow water that's just been sucked dry. And that's had one accident out there, and that's exactly what occurred. I got caught into the bow wave and got pushed into the mud. And there's nowhere to go, the water's gone. So that's just a good example of all the waves of breaking down here. Oh, yeah, yeah, high speed, dude. Yeah, yeah, um, uh, the other, yeah, let, me, let me finish that thought. Um, as these ships travel that entire length, 20, 30 miles, 
uh, the energy builds as it goes over time. It's just gained all this momentum. So where the wave started back with, you know, the dike, for example, if you to follow that ship all the way to Atkinson Island, it's twice as big, twice as powerful, and now the bow wave started breaking too. So um, you got to be really careful, of, uh, which I wasn't at that day. This is a good picture of the Bayport terminal cranes being brought in from China. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember that when they built the Bayport terminal for the cruise ships. Um, we were told this way that the ship wouldn't make a way. But there you have it, right there. <clears throat> this is a good example of. Well, Some of the folks that we've been um, fortunate enough to take down. These two gals are both uh, world champion, world champion surfers. Uh, they came and like showed everybody up, uh, and, and that was like really early on, like early 2000. And just to give you an example, that those ships right there, these container ships, are the uh, most hazardous ships to follow. Um, they have, they just place so much water and they are so deep um, that they literally close out the bay. Um, have you ever seen one of these guys come on over? Sir? Have you read one of the big bodies that's coming through? Oh yeah. <coughs> but not, but the, 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 are you talking about the tankers? I'm talking about the box or the box. The tankers. The tankers. 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 They got big 17, well, 22 line, 17 line. I don't know. Panamax. Oh, the Panamax. Oh, the Panamax. So, yeah, but the problem with these ships is they displace so much water that um, A, the, um, the energy misses the shoals. It, it pushes so far away from the channel and it distributes so wide because there's no way to get around them. So the, those are the one, those mm -hmm. one ships that so you're not are the most hazardous. hazardous. Like a container ship nowadays will be running 42 feet in, in trap. Yeah, in a, in a forty-five foot back trap. So there's not a lot of water below them. They're Those are big holes. The yeah, they don't up well at all. They don't even. You're looking really really for something that's more twenty-five feet deep or something like that. Uh, the magic number is like thirty-three. Thirty-three. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anything about it. Uh, I was told that. Oh, uh, that's a really beautiful shot of uh, of, of uh, going outbound near the near the. Uh, uh, I'm not gonna say that. But, Really, that's pretty much what I wanted to discuss. Um, oh, these are the only folks that we've ever come across, pretty much, that are all the nice air for this. This is a really, really good shot. These guys surf with us almost every day. I thought you might enjoy uh, that one. I do three times. And that is uh, the last slide of the show. Um, so uh, just to tell you uh, a few other things is uh, wind is a negative factor because no matter which direction or speed, wind is your enemy out there. Uh, and it makes it extremely um, difficult to keep up with the ship. Obviously these boats that we're using are very shallow draft. We get beat up in the wind and those guys just mow right through it. So um, I think that's pretty much the slideshow presentation. And if anybody has any questions, we'll be happy to have an answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, as long as there's at least 
I don't know, seven or eight feet underneath the hull, it might up well enough to make way. But, but we, we're really perplexed. These really large ships, if you think you're going to throw a monster wave, don't throw even so much as a wave because they're dragging the bottom. So we need, we need some distance between the hull and the bottom to, to make it really magic, magical. To answer your question, if it's going to affect us in the positive, um, that's going to take many years. Whenever they're dredging, they, issue, they, they uh, call for a slow belt. And when they call for a slow belt, all the ships have to slow down. That's true. So we're going to go years if they do that without any <coughs> waves at all. We went we went a couple years without getting waves when they were building the new island uh, off, off Kima. Because they issued a slow belt. Oh, they slowed down. Yeah, that was right in the middle of the playing field. So uh, yeah, that, that, that was a real bummer. One more point. I appreciate your, 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 your illustrating the safety. That's a huge issue. And, and you talked that it's legal. It is legal to do this. Everybody, yes, everybody's cool with it. But if somebody goes out there and gets killed, mm -hmm. you know, the capital of the court can shut this down. Yes. So I think it's imperative that we all do this in a safe manner. And like you said, go with somebody knows what the hell they're doing. Right. right. You know, some type of licensed uh, captain or, or registered, you know. That, that's the whole reason I got my captain's license because I saw it go below up. And, you know, one or two people going out there. I mean, we're still having incidents all the time. There's guys flipping, fishermen flipping their boats out there all the time. But chief of uh, police, chief of police, chief of police. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it, it's it's up to the boat operators to, you know, watch out for these waves. I mean, they're, they're everywhere, yes. all day, every day. It's much harder than he makes it seem, guys, to go out there, like, get into an 18 foot boat and whatever, and go find it. To serve. It's, it is hard. It's yeah. not. You gotta go with like, well, If you did just, hey, let's go find one, and you actually found one and rode away, it'd be like winning a lottery. Yeah. Yeah, you yeah. have to be extremely neurotic. Part of the part of it is all these over for four days and all of this 90 clothes waiting to come in, and then you're, you know, I'll tell you this next no, no, actually, you know, that sounds like the perfect scenario, but they put the slow guy in the front. So, uh, now everybody's going eight knots and you don't get a thing. <laughs> and, yes, sir? I'm just trying to understand the physics. So what kind of way, uh, way would you get if the anchor's out in open water? But without the um, ship channel? You wouldn't get anything if the water depth is, um, you know, that's too deep. It's all about the coming out of deep water and getting shallow, um, a shallow water. Is that the shelf of the of it, it's, the it's not it's not the acute change from from the channel depth to the shoal. It's areas that are unusually shallow because there is a, a large area between the channel and the shoal that's 12, 14 foot deep and it doesn't break or, or swell up there. When breaking water happens when the bell is tall, so Yes, exactly, exactly. Okay. Waves breaking water half as deep as they are tall. So you, it goes up on the shoal, let's say the shoal is three feet. Wave well, has to get to be six feet before it breaks. Okay. Correct. Now you can ride these things when they're not breaking. The, the, the whole dynamic is to try to catch the wave when it's breaking. Once you're in it, you can ride it for miles with it not breaking at all. You're just kind of locked into the energy and you, we've, we've we still hold the record at seven miles, so that's the longest way we can What was the time on that? About minutes? 35 minutes. 35 minutes? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's the longest way. Some nightmare will say. 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 Any other questions about safety? How much is tide going to change when you're out there? It's high tide or low tide, like right now, you know, it's on the side. That's a good question. The, the tide swings, since they're pretty nominal, maybe two foot, um, it doesn't have a negative effect on the real shallow water areas because they're already really shallow. So it actually makes it a little better. You won't be running on the oystery. But on the deep water spots, it, it shuts it down. Um, but, but you also have to realize that the tide swing from the north end of the bay to the south end of the bay takes hours to change. So if you're on the south end of the bay, the tide's not right. You just motor up to the north end of the bay, and the tide's just the opposite. So you can follow the tide and find spots that are uh, optimal for the tide depth. But, yeah, we've we've like we've trained, <coughs> traced every square inch of that bay, and 
how, how hard was it to develop a relationship with these Mopops Association and those guys? We were, uh, we were very quiet and, and protective of our area, but we were real respectful of theirs. And then I got invited to their annual barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> I got to meet, I got to meet a few of them. As long as you don't go out there and run in front of them and do something stupid, uh, you're just a speck. I tried to show a lot of these pictures. It's how far away you are when, when they're looking down on you. You know, you're you're pretty far away. And you're just you're you're pretty insignificant. I, I can remember when I moved back to Hawaii in 2006. I started working at Bayport. There was not an immigration on the line. I mean, you couldn't get a ship schedule. You know. And even I was in the industry, you still couldn't call. Now they yeah. I, I think you know, like everything is published, you know. So yeah, the, the, the pilot really schedule, schedule is private. Yeah. It's, it's privatized. People ask me all the time, do you have a schedule? And that's a big question. You, know, you, don't, you don't need this schedule. Honestly, we spent years, we didn't have any information. Right. <laughs> but this course is so busy, it averages 20 to 30 vessels a day. Yeah. If you have a day to learn, you're going to go out there and but you have maps now, like where you travel or whatever. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it does give you some of that. That's what I mean. We're the busiest port on the planet. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's all the time. That's, that's yeah. amazing. And not only that, but the, even the pilots themselves. How many pilots do we have in here? Ooh. Any pilots? There were a few coming, but. Okay. Well, even the pilots themselves get a two hour notice. Well, you got to remember one thing about those guys. The captain ain't always right, but the captain's always the captain. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the pilots. <laughs> <laughs> any other any other questions at all? Oh, yes, yes ma'am. Have you said Santos serving is the exclusive of Houston? Have you been done in another part of um, the USA? Or? It's it's exclusive in the sense of the consistency, the number of ships and the depth uh, and the length of the of the channel. I've not seen anywhere else that has all those dynamics. So I'm going to have to go out on a limb and say, yeah, we are the most unique channel for tanker surfing that I've ever heard of. And people reach out to me all the time and send me pictures of tanker surfing, but it's real fleeting and real short and just, you know, more of a novelty and not very consistent. So I think Houston really, uh, we are, we're the key in our tanker surfing for sure. Yes, sir. You're describing the tanker surfing that was started by it's not the highway. What is the dynamic that? Why do you get a highway or don't get a highway versus a stir? Um, the hole that the ship is making, all this water is coming, from, uh, trying to come back and backfill that hole. Right. And I think it all gets, a lot of it just gets caught up in all the stern energy. Now the bowway is really not surfable because it's at a 45 degree angle. It's really, uh, it, it misses the shoal. It's more of an aggravation, but it's, uh, it's, it's always been the stern energy. And I think it's just the way that the, the energy tries to backfill and fill that hole, like it's caught up in the energy and creates the set away. But I don't know, I'm not a... The way they set the draft up is, uh, the way they set the draft up is, um, it's, it's sort of like this, so you got a, a degree up front, uh, you know, and then by the time you get to the back, you know, so it's kind of pushing through like that. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's why, well, it's, the, the what I've seen, the, the stern way, the energy coming off the stern way is more of a 90 degree angle to the channel. Itself. Yes, sir. Exactly. exactly. As opposed to what he was talking about is the length of the channel, the bow wave is coming off at a 45 degree angle from that line. And if you surf it, if you catch it, you can catch it at that spot where you're right at it, but it's moving past the shoal in the deeper water. If you surf the, the stern line, the, the wave that's 90 degrees to the channel, you can travel along with the ship, moving up or down the channel either way, and that's how they end up surfing, surfing seven miles, five feet, or eight feet. Right. I mean, you might surf 45 seconds on a bow wave. Yeah, traveling. Oh, this the first question about the speed. Yeah. Um, that is one of the key factors of, of it actually making a tinker wave. Um, if they're going less than eight knots, they're not going to make a wave. But anything from maybe ten knots and up, it, it usually will make, make a wave. And the tankers usually travel. There, there's, I think, there's a speed limit, so they're not very speedy or anything. Negative. 
stress about these pilots speeding, that's, that's hogwash. These guys, uh, man, they know what they're doing. And they're they're going to be going the speed limit or less, and, but they need to be going at least 10 knots. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Do you offer trips? I guess sir, I uh, offer uh, charters. What are the requirements to get on the list? Oh, the requirements are you have to fill out a form and uh, be truthful about your uh, ability. You have to be intermediate to advanced. The well, way it is a fast moving ship. Do you uh, take uh, the search keys? Oh, uh, just, no, just serve, uh, just serve for law boards. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, what about all this, you hear about how polluted Galveston Bay is, benzene spills, uh, quarantines, and when the rain rains real bad, all that dumps into the bay. Yeah. Do uh, you ever concern yourself that you're going to grow a third eye? No. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Is that uh, any other questions at all, folks? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>